next study session, a continued discussion following the ARB Joint Council, ARB Council Joint Meeting. This is a discussion regarding Council's August 19th, 2013 directive to develop specific recommendations to address concerns regarding sidewalk widths and modifications to the El Camino Real guidelines. So this is just a check-in to see what people are up to and uh, keep us moving. So maybe you want, you want to start? Maybe I'll start off, I can report some progress. Alex and I were able to uh, get together this week and we spent quite a bit of time traveling up and down El Camino along with some of the arterial side streets and alleyways that are there uh, studying the parcels, figuring out where Palo Alto starts and stops, and uh, very interesting to look at it from that perspective. I think uh, one of the things that really will be useful to us, if you can make it available, would be to get uh, that map of El Camino. If you can dig up an old version of that, it, it doesn't have to be something you spend a huge amount of time on, but I think we're, we're thinking that there's some diagrams that we could prepare that would start to really illustrate some of the issues and having that would be the next step for us. It's going to be difficult for us to move forward from here without that. So uh, whatever you've got, just, you know, whatever you got. Alex, anything you want to add? Um, no, but I think that there's, there's a, a eye opening to look at it in really great detail like actually on site and looking at some of the issues that are there with the existing sites. So um, yeah, so we, there's a lot of work to be done. Palo Alto starts at the Country Inn Motel was something that never really clicked for me, but there it is, that's our gateway project. And um, I just started, just pulled out the, the zoning map and started identifying what different zones things are in along our section of El Camino um, and trying to note what was an area that looked as if it was sort of old and tired and somebody might be interested in redeveloping it versus things that are fairly new. So I'm just starting a, a diagram of that so that Lee and I can start looking at it in more detail. But uh, I note that the section we're working on, which is north of Page Mill, is primarily CN. I think you guys may have more CS than we have. Yeah, there's, there's more of a mix at our end, and, and maybe just to further illustrate what we were thinking of doing, uh, just so that we're not all working at cross purposes or in uh, too much the different directions. We were thinking of identifying, first of all, sort of what parcels are what zones and doing a quick color diagram that illustrates that. Uh, I think there is definitely a question about which are the more likely parcels to be redeveloped sooner rather than later. Some of them are vacant, some of them are um, old and tired, and some are brand new and not going to change for a very long time. And so uh, prioritizing in that manner, um, and in addition to that, also trying to look at uh, parcel size, because there is a tremendous variation in terms of the scale of parcels along El Camino and which ones have uh, more large scale development opportunity versus small scale and the issues that that might uh, drive in regard to how we treat zoning and, and the width of El Camino, sidewalks, et cetera. Amy, I had a question for you on this. Um, is there is there a change to the zoning? I think you mentioned something one time, in it, but I'm not sure I completely registered it properly. Is it that the city is not allowing like 100% residential projects in the, is it CS and CN, or is it just CS That's correct. Is it we, just limited to El Camino, or is it, um, you know, city citywide? How, and is that in the zoning? Like I have an old copy of the zoning ordinance, so I'm yeah. not sure if I, what I'm looking at is correct, but if you could just remind me of what. Yeah, so happening. there's two things. There's the, there's the housing element, which um, uh, got certified and has some cleanup uh, items for the zoning code that are gonna be coming forward. Um, so hopefully I'll get a schedule on that and let you know when that is. But um, part of that is identifying the housing sites along El Camino, um, but they're identified as mixed use sites uh, and they, uh, not purely housing. So we won't get another Arbor Real or just purely residential project because 
um, unless it's already zoned multifamily residential for some reason. Um, so any CN, CSN site, um, if they do residential, it will be mixed use. Um, yeah. And then there are some like R15 spots in the area that we were looking at. And I was wondering if you, if you could refresh us on why there are still some scattered yeah, uh, um, residential only things on, on El Camino? I mean, they're not a lot, but there, but there are Right, there are there's, a few. There's, there's, there's a notably few. vacant RM15 mm -hmm. site that, yeah. um, you know, Russ knows about um, because it's a project that, <laughs> that was submitted, what, over a year ago now? Um, that uh, they were considering doing a multifamily housing project, um, which they can do. It's by right zoning. However, um, there's concern in the neighborhood about a housing project going there. Um, so I don't know. It's an incomplete application. That's the one that jumps out at me. It's currently incomplete. It's an application to rezone from RM15 to RM30 <coughs> to get a few more housing, uh, it backs up against Thane Way, and those neighbors have been incredibly vocal about not wanting any pedestrian or vehicle, vehicular access to that street. Um, when the application was initially submitted, they had no plan to show us in terms of how they would intend to redevelop the site, but things have changed, and apparently they're working with, with Ken Hayes to develop a housing project, and so, um, They've shown it to the neighbors. They haven't shown it to us yet. <laughs> I haven't seen it, but um, the neighbors have seen their initial conceptual design, and um, we're just kind of waiting to see what they come back in with. And another one I can think of, um, I think it's in the southern part, is it was a blockbuster, but then it was converted mm -hmm. into a uh, synagogue, um, and I think it's zoned RM something or other. <laughs> um, so that's another one that I, I haven't heard. I mean, it's conditional use permit right now for that synagogue. Um, so, and let's see, is there anything else that's zoned RM? Not, I can't think of any others. Uh, you know, the, the Elks Lodge, I think, is right. still zoned RM. But, you know, that's got a CUP as well. Oh, the backside of the compadres site the compadres is now uh, vacant um, an oh we have an application in? No, soon. oh soon we're getting an application uh -huh. there's, there's those hovering projects out there on the horizon that we see coming into the shore and one last question for you um, so if you have like a hotel use you know the floor area is like a 2.0 maximum but if you have like a mixed use it's a 1.0 and i was wondering what the um how we came, how did the city come to that? Just general, I mean. I imagine it had to do with transient occupancy tax. Yeah. But there's no, so in our design guidelines, there isn't really any differentiation on how the massing would be handled with that different thing? So that is, is that, correct. We do not have in our context-based <coughs> guidelines that I can recall, or the El Camino Real guidelines, any different treatment when it's housing or hotel versus right. retail. Yeah. That's part of our That's the only thing that really charge that in mind. to I think to ourselves is to think about that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, is it possible to get from uh, transportation and ideas to the width of El Camino Real along where, where the sites that we're looking at? Um, there there's some planning rules of thumb which look at street width in terms of that and its relation to height, and maybe that might be something worth looking at also. Because I know that El Camino Real is not consistent all the way down. Right, okay, so there are places where it changes. So when you say the width, I mean, there's obviously the right of way that goes, you know, generally 120 feet, but are you asking as well, what, what is the width of the median? No, I'm asking what the width of the right of way. Curb to curb. Yeah. Property to property, yeah. Correct. And Robert, you get a pass this week because you're new, but we're going to start drawing you into a discussion of what to, what to do with El Camino Real. And oh. There's been a lot of discussion about sidewalk right. widths, et cetera. Yeah, so start thinking about it because next okay. time we're going to ask you to participate. <laughs> we have number seven. Are you related to item number seven or? 
Okay, so you'll be after that. Okay, item number seven, a general discussion of architecture, style, and compatibility. And I believe Randy has something to say about that. I also, I, before you start, I just want to make um, you aware that we do have a member, at least one member of the public that's here to speak on this item. So in case you weren't aware, I don't think uh, there's been a card submitted, but perhaps. Oh, excellent. Um, would you like to speak before we get started? You, you can fill the card later. Yeah. Uh, thank you to the distinguished board for allowing me the opportunity. Um, I have uh, opined in, uh, to you folks in plenty of communications already, so you know pretty much my general orientation. Um, to get to the heart of it, though, I think that there, I was surprised how many ordinances you have in the, in the municipal code and the comprehensive plan that focus on the issues of compatibility um, and uh, consideration for uh, buildings in the immediate environment of a proposed new development. And so what I was trying to do, I'm not a, a uh, an authority on real estate or city planning by any stretch, but I am a professional researcher, and so this is kind of just a new subject matter doing the basic research. And what researchers in any field are trying to do is go to the sources, get to the bottom of it. And I think that's uh, what I would uh, encourage the uh, planning department and the ARB to do. The it's a tall order because you have an awful lot of ordinances to balance. I recognize that. But I'm sure you have been quite sensitized, as is the city council, by all of the brouhaha uh, voiced by the public in the press and elsewhere about buildings that are publicly perceived as being uh, less than appealing, let's say. And uh, <clears throat> I worked for years. Um, see, I'm a music historian by background, and I uh, so innately uh, have worked my entire career on the arts. And uh, architecture is a newer interest for me, but on the last 10 years, I've been trying to develop a system for objective analysis of what makes this good? Why do I like this? Why is it not so great? And, uh, and to put it on objective grounds, because if it isn't on objective grounds, then uh, you may have five different opinions up there and another 50 opinions out here, and we, we simply can't talk to each other. And so that's my fundamental um, message that we need to get down to, go back to the basics, go back to the comprehensive code, or uh, comprehensive plan and the, um, the municipal code, both of which I have was very impressed by the wisdom and foresight in those documents, and uh, think about how do we develop um, objective standards for the, all the designs that are coming before you folks. Thank you, and I'm happy to com comment or, ask question or answer questions or whatever. Thank you for your comments. Okay, hey, Randy. Yeah, sure. I, you know, I, I think there are sort of two different topics here that I'd like to uh, talk about. One is making sure that the architecture review board's role is clearly understood in the mind of the public and that people are really appropriately educated about what it is that we do and why we do it why this board was created initially and uh, how the people who participate in it are selected from the public and supported by professional staff. Uh, I, I think that there needs to be uh, a public awareness of this that's generated in some manner and whether that's through an editorial that's written in the weekly, or whether it is a document that is clearly published so that people have access to it. Uh, I'm challenged regularly by some of the comments that people bring forward here and uh, my inability to respond because they're coming to the wrong place with those topics. You know, they bring to us items that should be a Planning and Transportation Commission. And the thing that I think uh, is most challenging for me is when I can't respond to someone and I can't take care of their concerns. And so I, I think we do need to have an education process that occurs so that uh, as Palo Alto is grappling with their concerns about aesthetics or 
zoning or um, any, any of these myriad of items that are coming forward, they clearly understand who is responsible for what and how to best manage those issues. Uh, you know, that said, and, and I'll, I'll respond to the, the comments that we've had here just recently, right? And, and I think that, um, that research is an important term. And um, I'm very troubled by a survey that was sent around recently. Um, and I, I, I know where it starts, and I, I have seen it. And um, the, the information that that survey created is so distorted in terms of its perspective and the number of respondents and where it's gone. And yet it's being touted as accurate. And I think that the, the concern that I have is that that becomes status quo. And it's, it's really not the right way to get that kind of information. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a very responsible way to garner public input. And it is certainly not in my opinion, an accurate representation of what Palo Alto stands for. Uh, I've had the opportunity recently to talk to a number of the architects who were really the founding fathers of Palo Alto, people who worked in Burge Clark's office. And some of these really spectacular uh, uh, buildings were drawn by some of the people that I was just recently talking to. And they're very troubled by uh, the idea that we should be replicating historical structures. Now, I, I'm not saying that we should be creating modern buildings everywhere we look and that we should pay no attention to context. I think that's critical, but the, the nature of architecture is that it is an art and it is subjective and it is emotional and it is not something that can be qualified in a logical and organized manner. It is, it's something that you react to. And there are different styles because there are different opinions. And just like ice cream has chocolate, strawberry, and vanilla, there's all sorts of different styles of architecture. And uh, what's right for one may not be right for another. But um, my friend Tony Carrasco uh, had a great quote last week when he said that every really ugly building has a very proud owner. And I think that um, while we're, we're struggling with how we manage the issues of challenging architecture, um, we are also locked into a zoning code that was written long ago that I think has a lot of insight and a lot of capability. And while um, there, there is no right or wrong answer to this today. I think that the, the key here is to educate people about what the regulations are, what is allowed by right, and part of what's beautiful about our process is that those things can be changed if people aren't happy about it, and that that's where we should be focusing our attention. And, um, I don't know. I'd, I'd love to hear what you guys have to say about this too. Please feel free. I'm going on and on. Well, you're an, you're you're a tough act to follow because I really want to be what I what I say meaningful and um, it's difficult. It's a very difficult process. And um, I sort of look at our task as, as, uh, as many fold. First of all, I think you hit the nail on the head that our body or our board is not responsible for everything. The, the, the city council, in fact, has delegated or parsed out the responsibilities and has very carefully delineated what our role is so that we don't get involved in um, in issues of planning, uh, the, uh, the use and the zoning, and transportation issues that we are solely dealing with quality and character issues. And um, if we did venture into that realm, we are really 
overstepping the line of what our responsibility is. And if we denied a project or we solely came down on an applicant and said, well, we're not gonna approve it because the parking is a, is a problem. Again, we don't have that uh, ability. Um, in fact, we would be doing the opposite of what this board is, is meant to do, which is to vet projects with regard to quality and character. Now, the nature of every city is that it is changing. You know, some 40 years ago, I watched the World Trade Centers go up. They were no doubt, uh, I don't think, uh, a beautiful piece of architecture, but it was impressive enough to inspire me to become an architect and to think about architecture and buildings. And it begins, begins to create a dialogue of what, you know, what a city is about or what a, a community is about. When the World Trade Towers came down, I don't think that there was, I, I don't think New York City was unanimous as to what should be going up in, in its place. But something need to be, needed to be done to address the whole issue. And I feel that that's very much the same thing with Palo Alto, that the nature of the city is that it is changing. And with that, we have to recognize that we are not the designers of the buildings. We are purely going through and making sure that they meet the requirements of what our regulations are. Um, I don't know how many times we've had the conversation about the South El Camino Real guidelines and how antithetical they are to what some of the uh, basic planning principles are today and how they have stayed in an era where we need to move beyond that. And I think that, you know, what's very difficult for this community is when they see change. They see their com the community that they know and they love disappearing. But it's not to say that we can't build or we cannot address the issues of a new community and redefine itself. And then just in, just in closing, I just want to say one final thing, which is look at a town or a city such as Florence, Italy, at the pinnacle of the Renaissance, a beautiful city, a wealthy city, one that really represented the most innovative, creative, dynamic people of the Renaissance period. Yet today, I would hardly call that the center of society today. Palo Alto is in the center of manufacturing and industry today, of innovation, of science, of technology. And for us to remain in that position, the city has to be responsive to that. Otherwise, we will become the Florence of, of high technology and science. We will cease being an important center of Silicon Valley. We will become a city on the edge of Silicon Valley. So, yeah. I don't want to, well, I don't want to get into the history of architecture, but I would just say that the, um, that many people, members of the community have ex expressed to me their unhappiness with existing, with the, you know, recent building projects. And many times they use the words, you know, like no redeeming value. Um, and I take that very seriously. And I always look at the projects afterwards to see, you know, what, to try to, you know, try to figure out what is working and what, you know, what, what isn't working and use that to inform my criticisms of projects that are coming in today. And, um, 
and I do think that you know there there have been mistakes made in the past, and I think that the board should sort of understand its role in 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 those mistakes. And then I wanted to say though too though that the very fact that there is an ARB here has made all of those projects better than what they would have been without design review. If you look at some of the unincorporated county areas, if you look at like some of the older parts of San Jose around the downtown that were sort of outside of the redevelopment district, they're awful. There's no, com there's no compatibility between neighboring projects whatsoever. And we try to do what we can here. Um, but you can see that there's a clear difference between Palo Alto and some of, the, and some of these other places that have less uh, design review. Um, I think one of the things when I ask, you know, clients or friends, whatever, like, why do they live in Palo Alto? And, you know, the schools is obviously one of the reasons. But the other reason that comes up, usually, you know, first or second, is uh, the beautiful streets that each house is different, but yet everything fits together. There's a scale and quality and character that's uniform here, and it's more uniform than most other comparable cities. And some other city, you know, like Woodside may be beautiful, but it's really just mostly just houses, right? I mean, Palo Alto has much, you know, has much more diverse and broader ranges of uses. And I think that uh, given that complexity, we're actually doing a very good, um, you know, fairly good job at it. That's not to say that some of the other pro recent projects haven't been perfect. Um, and I think that's all I will say about this subject. And I will just weigh in a little bit on style that it's not the Architectural Review Board's role to determine what the style should be of a project. Applications come to us, we work with them to make them better. If a craftsman style comes in, we work with them to make the craftsman style the best craftsman style we can. We don't say, no, it shouldn't be craftsman, it should be a glass box. But if a glass box comes in, then we work with them to make the glass box as compatible with the the surroundings as we can. So that's what I see as our role, not to dictate a particular style, but to work with what comes to us and to try to help to mold it into a better project. So unless there's follow-up on this one, we had one more board business. Lee? Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, 240 Hamilton Avenue uh, went before City Council. City Council uh, pulled it from the consent calendar and decided to hear the item. And, Do we know when? and I'm waiting to hear so I can go for, you know, to represent ARB. And so I wasn't able to, to really say anything or do anything. They just pulled it. So, of course, I was recused from that project, but I did want to just ask because I'm I'm new to the board and haven't been. Uh, here in a period where there was a project that has been uh, referred to council and council has decided to do a de novo review of the project. Uh, and I, I just want to understand maybe what is uh, process or procedure here a little bit because I think that uh, one, one of the roles of the architecture review board is to support the council in their review of architecture. And uh, I'd like to just understand because my, my requirement to recuse from these projects ends on October 4th. So I have an opportunity perhaps to participate in a different way and wanna make sure that I'm available for that. Will there be an opportunity for us to interact with council about this project or projects like this in advance of their hearing the project so that we can provide some background, we can give them some context, we can help them understand uh, why the decisions this board made were made, et cetera. It'd be really great to be able to have some dialogue with them in advance of their crafting a direction or decision. Um, that's never happened um, that I'm aware of um, when we've gotten an appealed project. It's uh, simply the format of they decide whether or not to hear it. In this case, they have. <clears throat> The ARB is asked to attend the hearing, uh, one ARB member to represent, nothing to prevent more of you than one person to show up and be in the audience um, and to, you know, be in the room for the event. <laughs> 
but I think that's been the practice is generally one person goes uh, as is the representative for saying what happened at the ARB and, and doing their best to represent what happened at the ARB, why, all of that. So that's pretty much how it works. Yeah. The I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just want to say the difficulty is that, you know, when we uh, put together a, a motion and it moves forward, um, it, it really needs to be heard through, through one person. It can't be heard through multiple people. It makes it very confusing for the city council. Oftentimes, council has questions about about the uh, the discussion and the deliberations and the findings. Um, also, in addition to that, um, the member also needs to stay on track and can't veer or go outside of the discussions. So, in other words. Uh, whatever has been formulated here exists in a, it, it as as a, in its entirety. You cannot augment it. It's been sort of packaged up and and left in that in that bundle. And so um, there have been times where multiple members of either the ARB or the Planning Commission have gone to council. Generally. Those have been when um, a member of the ARB is speaking as a member of the public, not representing the board and making that very clear up front. So in your case, you know, you were, you were not party to this discussion and you might feel differently. Um, in addition to that, um, there have been uh, times where the ARB has made a recommendation and the director's recommendation is in variance to the board, and that's happened, I think, maybe twice. That's it. Um, in which case, there would be another sort of ARB member who could, you know, where the ARB could speak on that because it, it is in variance to what the board had recommended or deciding. A dissenter, though, would not be, it would not be appropriate for a dissenter to, to come. To that. Yeah, and the, sometimes the council will ask questions that, um, as a representative, you won't be able to answer to represent the board. Sometimes they'll ask a question to about something that the board did not discuss. In which case, you have to then say the board did not discuss that. Uh, yeah. So, so I, I I appreciate all that. Thank you for the explanation, and, and that was part of what I was trying to gain understanding of. But you know, a piece of this is just making sure that. We have uh, a council who is not otherwise trained to review architecture, uh, giving them the, the tools, however brief the education would be, uh, to be able to go forward. And I, I'm not trying to suggest that this council is not capable of making a decision about architecture, but just making sure that they really uh, have uh, an understanding about what context really means and what character and quality really means and uh, the things that are uh, part of our years and years and years of training and they're going to be providing direction on for a building which will ultimately stand for many many years once that decision is made and I, I'll, I'll just say publicly that that concerns me. I presented to the council on occasion on some projects, like rezoning projects that had to come to the council. And I want to say that they, they from my experience, is that they go by the what's in the comp plan. Like, I mean, they stay pretty focused on what's in our own, talk, you know, what's in our own city documents. Um, and then we don't normally have verbatim minutes, but my understanding is when there's an appeal, they have full transcripts of everything, of everything, and that's not normal. I mean, like, if you see, like, PTC, they have verbatim minutes for every me meeting, and we don't. But I know that when, it, when something like this happens, they actually do get, they do get that. Okay. We are adjourned. <laughs>